All right, good afternoon, folks. Welcome to class, good afternoon. Um, today we have two guest speakers. We're gonna be focusing on Chicana and Chicano music today. Um, so we have a special treat for you. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our first guest speaker because he was so cordial to squeeze in time during work to be with here, to be here with us today. So uh, I don't wanna take up too much of his time. So let me just bring up his bio folks. Give me a second. All these tabs to go through. All right, y'all. So with us today, we have Jose Cano from Las Cafeteras. He is a second child of immigrant parents from Jalisco, Mexico. Jose was born and raised in Oxnard, California, and he's a founding member of the East LA band Las Cafeteras and has toured extensively over the last 10 years all over the US and Canada, as well as several other countries abroad. Living the life, all right, Jose. He first started playing music in middle school concert band and his first drum kit came in high school after watching some friends play at a family party. And it's been all about holding down the beat ever since. Afrobeat, reggae, funk, R&B are some of his main rhythm and drumming influences. Jose holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from California State University, Los Angeles. Before dedicating himself to music full time, he worked as a freelance design engineer while attempting to start several businesses. Some worked, most didn't, until finally the right opportunity came. Sustainable living, the Dharma running, the Dharma running, biking, swimming in the ocean, boxing, community, art, and culture are among some of his passions. Jose currently owns and operates his own recording studio in Oxnard and is more active than ever writing and recording music. Thank you for joining us, Jose and Maya. I will introduce you right after Jose, uh, but I'm gonna go ahead and pass the mic to Jose. Thank you for joining us. Um, tell us a little bit more about your experiences um, in music, Jose, if you don't mind. And if there are any links that you want me to share and videos you want us to watch, please let me know. I do have the ones from last semester. So you just let me know what you want me to share. Okay, I'm gonna pass the mic over to you. <laughs> Okay, cool, cool, cool. Uh, thank you, Vero. Hello, by the way, Vero. We haven't spoken for a bit, so nice to be uh, on here again. Uh, thank you for inviting me to your class. Hello, everybody. My name is Jose Cano. Um, I'm a, I, somehow in life, I ended up being a musician. It's not some, something that I set out to do. I just played music for fun. Um, I'm part of this band called uh, Las Cafeteras, and um, we started out of a community space in El Sereno. So that's kind of like on the east side of LA, um, maybe like 13 or 14 years ago. Um, we started out of just like a, it was a group of students that were taking free music classes. And, and it was like Jarocho, like Son Jarocho classes. And uh, Son Jarocho started to really come on, like, uh, you know, kind of, kind of come along on the scene and a lot of people started playing and, and joining and wanting to learn how to play. Um, and so Las Cafeteras was just one of those groups of students learning how to play this really beautiful communal music. Um, so as time passed, you know, we were a group of maybe like 30 people and then it kind of went down to like 15. Then we started playing like fundraisers and coffee shops. And then all of a sudden we became a band. And now all of a sudden we're playing on stages and then you know, fast forward many years and we've been to a lot of different places all over the country, many other countries. And, um, and this kind of ended up becoming my, my job. Um, you know, I went to school for engineering, so I have Mexican parents, so they weren't very happy about me leaving an engineering job for an artist job. But anyways, that's how life ended up. Um, so if maybe you all are familiar or not with Las Cafeteras, but we've always been a band that has um, been rooted in, um, in like in community in social justice in uh, messages of um, liberation and empowerment. So before we were a band, we were all just like community organizers. A lot of us were in Mecha. I'm not sure if Mecha is, is still around. Um, it is, so that's great. Um, a lot of us were in Mecha, a lot of us were part of just different community spaces and different efforts uh, getting involved um, in the community. And so like naturally kind of for us, it was easy for that messaging to kind of like manifest itself within our music. Um, so a lot of people, you know, a lot of times people sort of refer to us as like a, a quote unquote, like political band. Um, 
for us, we're kind of like, we take the, we, we kind of like to say, well, we're storytellers. You know, we, we tell stories and, you know, artists, artists, we all tell stories through our different mediums. And for us, we, you know, when somebody says, I, I think it's, it's, you know, sometimes people ask us like, uh, you know, you guys are really political or how come you guys are so political? But, but for us, it's more like, well, you know, like if, if I talk about like my aunts and my uncles and my parents who came like looking for better life and were here legally and, and like, we're just searching for that, like ability to give their children a little bit more, like for us, that's not political. That's just, that's just life. That's survival. That's like resilience of, 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 of our people. Um, and so that's kind of like where Las Cafeteras is rooted in, in that messaging. Um, we've always had like a sound of like a, a folk, a folk sound, but we're also like, you know, we grew up in the city. We grew up listening to like, you know, hip hop and rock and reggae and rap and all that stuff. And so we were able to kind of like take this really like traditional, beautiful music from the countryside in Southern Mexico, and then kind of like mix it with a lot of the influences that we've had growing up. So, you know, it came it like what came out was like this hybrid music, um, that's brought us a lot of joy. Um, and we've gotten to share that over the years with, um, with a lot of people. Um, Beto, I don't know if you've, if you've gotten to show um, your class any of, the, any of the videos or if they know any of, like if they know what the band sounds like. I don't remember what the videos were that were on that link. Can you remind me what they are? Um, let, me, let me read them to you. I think there's titles, hold up. Let me find that link again. Where did you go? And if anybody has any questions or any, you know, feel free. I, I don't, I can't really see. I'm on my phone. Um, so, okay. Yeah, There's so a, you had sent one that's called Mujer Soy. And then the other links just say live shows and it doesn't have a title of what those were. And then there's La Bamba run with Ahmad, mm. another live show. But I can, Maybe we just, can show any of whatever you think it would be the most relevant. I think it's also important to kind of show them like, just uh, like a straight up traditional son jarocho so they can see kind of like the original and then how you blended it with all these other genres, right? So- Yeah. Um, I don't know if I gave you a, a sample of, of, of a traditional one. Does, um, I, I don't know if, if folks are, are familiar with, with son jarocho, but everybody knows it's probably the most popular song on the planet is La Bamba. So La Bamba, was popularized by Richie Valens who made it into a rock and roll song. But the original manifestation of that song is a Son Jarocho song. Um, so I don't know how we could show that. Um, yeah, our, let I, me, um, I'm gonna look up. I see one that's called Veracruz, Son y Huapango and there's La Bamba. Yeah, show I that one? yeah, that's fine. Okay, let me, just so y'all can get a feel for, let me get rid of that advertisement. And we could probably just play maybe like a minute of it or just to get the, the, the vibe across. Gotcha. Okay. Let me share my screen. Necesita una poca de gracia, sí, qué una poca de gracia y otra cosita y arriba y arriba, Arribita. arriba y arriba y arriba y de yo no soy marinero, yo no soy marinero por ti seré, por ti seré, por ti seré. All right, um, so you can get a feel, everyone. Um, like, give me a thumbs up if you have heard Richie Valens La Bamba. If you've heard that version, okay, cool, thank you. There's all the thumbs up. Okay, so as Jose was explaining. The one you just heard right now is more of an original version, right? Through the uh, Son Jarocho style from Veracruz. So now I'm gonna show um, Las Cafeteras version of La Bamba. How about that? That way you can see how it's all mixed in. You can watch the video. Cause in the video, you're also gonna see a lot of the cultural um, elements and the fusion, right? Of like what we wear and how we carry ourselves, right? This fusion of all these different cultures from south of the border and uh, from here. So let me get that going. Okay, here we go. Porque somos chicanos de East LA, allá 
violencia contra la ley de racistas. Contra la ley de racistas en Arizona, ahí arriba, ahí arriba. Ahí arriba, ahí arriba, ahí arriba, ahí arriba. Hey, yo no soy de la migra. Yo no soy de la migra. Ni lo seré, ni lo seré, ni lo seré. in the mood to dance now. Um, so I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna ask you to explain a little bit about, um, just for those of us that don't speak Spanish, a little bit about the messaging and the lyrics. But first I wanna ask students um, to just kind of unmute yourself and, and talk about some of the visuals. What, what were the things that you saw and noticed in the video um, that make it, you know, so Chicana and so Chicano, because this isn't something that we would typically see in Mexico in a traditional Son Jarocho setting. Um, so uh, just, yeah, just call out some of the things that you saw in the video. What did you see? <laughs> Who has a rooster? <laughs> oh, the neighbor. I'll mute it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear your voices, y'all. I'm just all I'm asking is for you to tell me what you saw in the video. Like a sense of community and and all the dancing. All right, all right. Thank you, Ernesto. Who else? Come on, y'all. Where are you at today? Where are you at today, students? <laughs> <laughs> 
I also saw a lot of instru like some instruments that I didn't recognize. So those were the unique sounds I kept hearing. Yes, for sure. Thank you, Ernesto. What else did you all see? For me, I don't know, like to study some, like if they'll take it back, but like the sense of humor, how there's like the culture aspect of like la migra, la migra. And I was just like, oh, wow, like it's so true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's reality, right? And sometimes we have to um, bring in that humor just to make it easier to be brown in the United States, you know, just to kind of get through things. Um, good, good, uh, good point there, Maria. Anyone else? The style of dressing. Explain it to us. What did you see in the style of dressing? Um, they incorporated like the traditional like Mexican blusas and like with the style with the same style of dancing, but like the I am undocumented shirts, you don't see people in Mexico wearing those because they're in Mexico, but um also like the the khaki pants, like the dickies or whatever they call them and um, like shoes, does, they're like pinup hairstyles. There you go, there you go, breaking it down, Jasmine. Very uh, good observations. <laughs> yes, yes, so that's what, you know, I think that's what makes it like so Chicana and Chicano, right? Because it, obviously it's filmed in the LA area, right? And so you see all that element of just what LA is, um, but also their dress. So they're mixing in these traditional Mexican um, styles with our, you know, modern Chicana, Chicano type of style, right? So we got all this stuff going on. And then um, also the dance. So there was, you know, the, um, I, what do they call it? Jose, help me with the tacones. Zapateado. Zapateado, thank you. I'm stuck. Yeah. Zapateado. But then they're also doing like, you know, these kind of like yeah. break dance and b-boy type of stuff. So everything's like a fusion you know, from what they eat, how they dress, how they carry themselves, the dance, uh, the food, everything is a fusion, right? And that's what our reality is like here. You know, we're from both places at the same time. So that's that's the beautiful part of it. Um, uh, and so, yes, Jose, if you can explain a little bit of the, um, of the messaging behind that song. Yeah, so um, this is for a class at, uh, at, at Channel Islands. Yeah. So then I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that many of the students at Channel Islands um, kind of live in the area are from kind of like Ventura County. Is that, is, that, is that the case? Let's see your thumbs up, folks, who's from Ventura County. Are, are any folks like from Oxnard? I, I can only see on my, on my phone, so I can only see four people at a time. Okay. Um, Unmute okay. if you're from Oxnard and just say, I'm from Oxnard. I'm from Oxnard. I'm from Oxnard. <laughs> I'm from Oxnard. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay so this is this is perfect because um so i grew up in oxnard and so like when you grow up in oxnard you know like how sometimes the neighboring communities and people from the neighboring communities uh perceive oxnard and parts of oxnard and and the, and and come to certain like um conclusions about people from oxnard sometimes at least me growing up um some of my friends from Camarillo or from Ventura or wherever, um, you know, would say that Oxnard's ghetto or that it's dangerous or don't get off there. Like it was, it's kind of like, it's, it's really out there, you know, but that's a reality of like how a lot of folks in this community are perceived, how we are perceived often. Um, and so when we did this video La Bamba, granted this video is about 10 years old. Um, and, uh, and, we would go around the country and we do this exercise because part of what Las Cafeteras has done historically is that we've also given kind of like workshops at colleges and stuff like that, informative uh, empowerment workshops. And, and a lot of the times in storytelling and in history, it's, it's what ends up becoming history is like who controls the narrative. And um, so for us, we, we would ask people to raise their hands if they've ever heard of East LA because Las Cafeteras was, was born in East LA. So then everybody's heard of East LA through movies or whatever, cholos. Um, and we would ask them, okay, what are some of the things that you've heard of East LA? What are some of the stereotypes of East LA? Not that you believe them, but what are some of the stereotypes? And can anybody, okay, can anybody here just shout out, like, what are some of the stereotypes of East LA, whether you believe them or not? Anybody, anybody. They're probably really similar stereotypes to Oxnard. 
Gangs. Gangs. High crime rate. Crime. Graffiti. Graffiti. Poverty. Poverty. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Ghetto. Yeah. Ghetto. Somebody put yeah. MS-13 in the chat. And I'm yeah. going to throw in uh, black and brown. Yeah. Mostly yeah. brown. But. Yeah. And so those, I mean, and, and we notice these are stereotypes. And like I said, whether we believe them or not, they're stereotypes and they're not necessarily positive stereotypes. I think, uh, Beto, I think you threw in maybe the one positive one, <laughs> uh, you know, but like, so the whole world sees East LA with all of these negative stereotypes. And so let me ask you this question. Are those stereotypes true? I would say like, I think it depends on, on the person, right? So like, it, cause it's, it could be true to some people and probably the most of them are gonna be the ones who have the negative stereotypes. Mm -hmm. probably to those who live there um they would oppose that and say like no those stereotypes aren't true um because they're probably you know full with happiness and joy and communal so when they think of those stereotypes it's like more of that negative uh perspective yeah yeah i mean we know like folks who like if we grew up in oxnard we could probably have a lot of those same stereotypes like attached to to our city as well are those stereotypes true? I mean, I didn't, I didn't grow up in East LA. I lived on the East side for like 15 years. I know a bunch of people from East LA. And so in their words, they would say all of those stereotypes are true, but that's only part of the story. That's the problem is that stereotypes only, only tell this much of the story when there's so much story to come. Oh, you muted yourself, Jose. Unmute again. Oh, man, I was saying all prolific stuff. Uh, I don't know how long I was muted, but... Uh, what, just for uh, a second, just for a second. Okay, so at Las Cafeteras, what, what we wanted to do is that we knew that those were the stereotypes of, of East LA, of the community that we were all either born from, living in, or a part of. And so what we wanted to do with our video and our song and our music in general is show the world a different narrative of who we are and what we do. And so in this video that, that we just saw a couple minutes ago, um, I think like, I think it's easy to have totally different reactions. I mean, there's a lot of colors, there's a lot of joy, there's a lot of smiling people, there's a lot of like beauty that we tried to demonstrate. And I think that's what's so powerful about all of us telling our story, telling the stories of our history, of our people, of our community. We're not, we're not all criminals. We're not all lazy, bad people that are just sucking from the system. Of course, of course, that's not who we are. We know that that's not who we are, but that's what often many people perceive certain communities to be like. So that's why it's so important for us to tell our story. Um, you know, I've, I've learned a lot um, over the years of, different communities of folks by allowing myself the opportunity to listen. I knew very little about like African-Americans, about black folks in the US and about their realities. I knew very little about women and the struggles of women and the challenges that women face that I, I to be honest, I was clueless. I was so ignorant and I still am, you know, I'm still sort of working and I still have to be diligent in giving myself the opportunity to learn about other people and other people's challenges so that I can have a better understanding and just be a better, um, a better human in the world. Um, so that's kind of so much of what we've done. I mean, there's Cafeteras is many things. Cafeteras has many different storylines. Um, we started, we play music, but we're so much more than just music. And, and, and just like you, you're students, but you're so much more than just a, a student. Um, we've. Uh, we, we tour all over the country and we do these sort of kind of workshops all over the place. And many times we go to the Midwest, the South, the East Coast, all over the place where we're often the only people of color in the venue, in the classroom. Like we give, we mainly play for like white audiences. 
And for us, we see that, um, you know, it's, we see that as a great opportunity to like communicate who we are as people to a community that may never come to our neighborhood, may never otherwise have come to learn about us. So we go straight to them and we have really positive interactions that, that end up like being really great opportunities for growth. So, um, I mean, I think being in a band is, is, is really hard, is really challenging. There's, there's a lot of demands, but, but for us, like me as a person in this band, seeing the value that is brought to our, you know, to our society by being able to share stories has been so like motivating and inspiring for me. And it's like, so something that I think is really important to encourage all of you to continue to do, to start doing, give yourself the opportunity to, to, to share your stories, but also to listen to the stories of other people. I think we'll all be so much more enriched for it. Thank you so much. Y más que nada, thank you and your compañeros and your compañeras from Las Cafeteras for your contributions. These are major, major con contributions because again, it's really highlighting the beautiful, all the many, many beautiful aspects of our culture and who we are as a people um, while paying homage to our ancestral cultures too, right? Down of south of the border and uh, whether they're on sense ancestral or more contemporary, but we're like, you know, um, it's helping us to stay connected to our Mexican heritage, right? And, and not losing that as we are on our journeys here in the LA area or in California or in the Southwest, you know, north of the border, because it's really easy to lose our language, our culture, our, our ways of knowing, our ways of eating um, and what we eat. It's really easy for that to just dissipate um, if we're not intentionally trying to stay rooted in that and it's so it's way too beautiful to lose right as part of who we are um but i do want to ask tiffany to unmute because you made a really um that was a really good comment that you shared in the chat and jose can't read it because he's on his phone so if, if you can unmute and just um share your comment tiffany um yeah i just mentioned that i was raised like Boyle heights east la area and like my grandparents and my mom like we lived there all our lives so we didn't really know of the stereotypes that were given to us. And many people, when I moved here, they were telling me that, oh, it's ghetto, or it's like, um, I can't believe you lived out there. And it's for me, since we knew the community, we knew the people around us, we felt safe. And there's others that don't feel safe. So now that I go back, maybe like, it's been about eight years since we moved, it doesn't feel the same, like it feels different. And I know it's because a lot of like community, like we leave, we, like people move and people, it's not, it wasn't the same, but yeah, I, I understand that very much. And I understand how there's a lot of history, like a lot of the murals, a lot of things that were mentioned is like, I've always used to see it every day. And I didn't know it was like such a big part of like other people's lives as well. So I thought that was like, it's nice to see, like it's cool. <laughs> If, if you don't mind me asking, in what way was it not the same? Um, like going back afterwards, mm -hmm. um, I felt like a lot of um, community members, like neighborhoods, like there's people moving out or we didn't feel the same security just because they didn't know who we are anymore. I, it's been like eight years. So I feel like a lot of the little stores, like there's a lot of gentrification going on. So like down the street, there used to be like a 24 hours and they made it into a Panda Express. So it's like, we used to grow up eating in that place and we had a lot of like familiar faces and now we kind of don't see that anymore. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Bo Boyle Heights is changing, is changing, uh, it's changing a lot and it's changing pretty rapidly, uh, unfortunately. Highland Park is the, you know, it's, it's a neighborhood close to here. I, I lived there for a long time and that one totally, changed um and so yeah that yeah does with this, the sixth street bridge going on too like i remember we used to go on runs just on the bridge and now like the yeah. creating there's a lot of like media and a lot of attention brought to it as well yeah and we see things like in, in oxnard things are changing a, a lot too like if we see like a lot of that um a lot of the housing that's going up in in oxnard is a lot of like very expensive housing there are some affordable housing but there's some really like big housing complexes and so that's not really made for people who live there 
Um, it's made to kind of bring in outside people because most of the folks there, so many of the folks, a very large population of the folks there, um, yeah, they can't afford that kind of housing. So it's not just happening in LA, in LA it's also happening, you know, the 805. Yeah, that's a trip because when you think about like the uh, Boyle Heights and the history behind that and how it's been so Chicano for so long and now it's being gentrified, it's like it's one of the places that you would think that wouldn't happen to and it's happening, right? And um, some people argue that it's it's this modern form of colonization again because, you know, people kind of creep in, take over the resources and push everyone out, right? And so um, that's really unfortunate. So we as a people have to get a lot more um, financially savvy and, and keep monies in our communities so that that doesn't happen. And I think that there needs to be a lot of discussion around that in uh, black and brown communities um, to, to protect our neighborhoods, right? Um, and it's one thing to like have uh, these cultural neighborhoods, right? Where we have pockets of, of peoples, right? We have Koreatown, we have, you know, and that's cool to maintain culture um, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't integrate and be desegregated, but what happens is that um, as desegregation happens, then all the prices spike up like crazy and then the working people can't afford it. So they're pushed out. So then you're really not desegregating. You're just re-segregating in a different way, right? So it's like, okay, y'all gotta move out. There's a new group of people coming in and it might be uh, race or class or maybe a combination of those two things, right? Whoever can afford to to set up a business there and pay crazy rent for their spot whoever can afford to uh, rent an apartment or buy a home there and it just you know so it's it's race and it's class as well not neither one of those um, alone so that's what makes it complicated but um, it's also it also speaks to why it's so important for us to continue learning and building solidarity and figuring out how we can come together to solve these major problems that um, where we're facing as, as brown communities um, and then also thinking of how we can use the arts, right? The visual arts, performing arts, music, poetry, uh, danzas, all of that to, um, to maintain our cultural values and our identities. Um, so yeah, does anyone else have any questions or comments? Okay, folks, so um, I know that there is a group um, that is working on presenting a song from Las Cafeteras for your final project. So I'm looking forward to that. And because um, they have a final project, y'all, about um, the students have a final project where they have to present their favorite Chicano art piece and then their favorite Chicano song, right? Or Chicana song. Um, and so I know that there was some, a group who, um, cause I was saying, oh, Jose, Jose Cano from Las Cafeteras is gonna come and Maya Arce is gonna come um, on Monday. So, you know, and they're like, wait, who, who? I think, wait, is he from that one band? And so, yeah, so just looking forward to that. And I hope that whatever group that is, I hope you're really enjoying today's conversation and that it might fuel um, your presentation a little bit more now that you know, you know, straight from one of the band members, what this is about. But if you have any questions for him, um, now's your chance. Don't be shy, everybody. Don't be shy, everybody. Don't be shy, <laughs> folks. Let's hear your voices or even a comment. Uh, hey, this is Fernando. Um, I think earlier you had mentioned you were originally from Oxnard. Do you still live in Oxnard currently? I do now, yeah, yes. I live in uh, I live in South Oxnard, so I grew up on the I, I grew up on the north side, moved to South Oxnard, and I I really dig South Oxnard. I like it out there a lot. Sweet. Nice. And uh, just one one more question. Sorry, um, do you guys plan on doing any shows anytime soon? You know, we actually we actually are. We we have um we have our first. Our first show with an audience on Wednesday. It's a small audience. It's a private thing. But like, we've been out. Um, we've been out of commission since like March of last year. Um, so we have, yeah, we have we have a couple of shows coming up. We have a show, a possible show in Thousand Oaks. It would be a free show. Um, it's still not for sure that it's going to happen, but it's very likely going to happen. And uh, I'll let I'll let Beto um, know about that. And uh, so if you all want to come out, but it'll be in Thousand Oaks. And I think it'll be in June, like late June. Yeah. 
Oh man, I can't wait for that. Please don't forget to let me know because I have to roll up on that. <laughs> okay. yeah. um, and then there's a question from Brittany. Do you want to unmute Brittany? Are you able to? Sometimes students can't um, uh, unmute for, for whatever reason, whether they're at work or something's going on, but oh yeah, she can. So her question is, is, is um, have you toured the USA? And what is the feedback you get from different areas that you've toured in or at? Yeah, I think we've only been, we've been to like, I think we've performed in maybe 45 out of the, the 50 states. So we've gone, we've gone all over the place. And um, it, it's really, it is really, it's super interesting because we play for all kinds of different audiences. In some of the big cities, we play to very like Latino, Chicano audiences. In some places, like we play for mainly like a white audience. So it's like across the board of, of, of who shows up to those places. I think what, what we strive to do a lot as a band, as performers, as entertainers and as storytellers is to always like communicate through like the, the human, like, in, like through like the human element and uh and show you about like you know who i am but like like on a heart to heart connection and i think whenever you when you when you build that connection then um then it's kind of undeniable you know when you allow people to see when you open up to people then people open up and so it's a really beautiful thing is like whatever barriers are like who we voted for or whatever our political beliefs are for at least that moment we're able to kind of set a lot of those aside because we're connecting as as people um i think most places they like they they for the most part enjoy the music i think they what they enjoy more is the connection um i think as 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 artists or as communicators or whatever it is with our work that connection is like the really the really valuable part so overall we we've gotten like very like very good feedback um over the years I think we're a fun group to watch. We're pretty energetic, um, but but we we all you know on top of that, when you're able to connect, is is very is super valuable. So we've gotten positive feedback overall. <laughs> and that's and even as you travel through the south, I remember you um, uh, sharing that before. Like even in those states where um, they're pretty conservative, uh, even then you're able to break through those barriers and make that human connection. So that's, that's a beautiful thing. And we need more of that for sure, for sure. Um, but, uh, I want, there was something else I wanted to ask you, but ya se me fue. Um, for sure. I want to uh, be able to catch, catch you all. Oh, that's what I wanted to say is that like their concerts, they are very energetic. They're super, super fun. Um, but they're, they're emotional, like, you go through this emotional ride because there's like the highs where you're just like, yeah, you know, feeling it. And then they're hitting some like really, um, I don't know, it, not sad things, but things that are just so profound that they hit you in a different way, right? Like I was, um, I was at one of your guys' concerts with um, a compañera and it was her first time being at your concert. And she was like, so much like, oh my God, I think I'm gonna cry right now. I'm trying not to cry, you know, cause it was just like so impactful in that way. Um, and not because it was sad, it was just because it was um, like so beautiful, like, wow, like this is who we are, right? And so it's just really impactful that way. So it's a, a great, amazing, amazing show. And it's just so much fun. And they do bring it to the stage on fire every single time. So if y'all can catch it, like go, go and celebrate and have a good time and um, just learn. If it's not of your culture, it's a great way to learn the culture and to connect in that human way that, that Jose is talking about. And if it is your culture, then it helps you just learn about it more, right? And it gives you an opportunity to embrace it in that moment. So highly encourage you, but I wanna thank you, Jose. I know you're working and you got a lot going on, but thank you for coming through. I appreciate you in so many ways, brother. And I can't wait to see you in person and to go support you all at your next concert as always. Mil gracias for being with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vero. Thank you, everybody. Um, sorry, I have, to, I have to head out early, but it was really fun being here and sharing with y'all. And I hope to cross paths with y'all later. So thank you again. All right. Thank you, Jose. Have a good day. All right. Bye. Bye.
Okay, y'all, so I'm gonna go ahead and introduce you to our next guest speaker who is also in music and very, very talented. Um, I'm gonna introduce to you Maya Arces, who is a mariachi performer, who has been a mariachi performer since the age of seven, and now a current member of a folk group in Los Angeles called Grupo Bella. She was a plaintiff in the Arce versus Hupenthal slash Douglas case in the US District Court, District of Arizona, and the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals for the United States. And just a little background, y'all. So um, this is the case that took place in Arizona when um, the school district in Tucson was trying to eliminate the Mexican American Studies program. Um, so it ended up going to the Supreme Court. And so um, the Ninth Circuit Court. Uh, and so there was this whole uh, legal battle going on and the judge actually um, sided with the Mexican American studies um, educators um, and saying that uh, the elimination of the program was based on racial animus, which is really, really, really difficult. That hardly ever happens. Um, and so that was a major win. And so uh, Maya was, uh, was a plaintiff in that case. Uh, and maybe you could talk to us a little bit about that. Uh, but this, this helped lead the case, helped lead the successful constitutional challenge to Arizona's anti-Mexican American studies law. Um, she's currently, she currently is a full-time musician and has performed all over LA and parts of the country and Mexico. Maya, welcome. Thank you for being with us. I'm gonna go ahead and hand the mic over to you and just tell us a little bit more about yourself and what you do and the group and the music, beautiful music that you all uh, produce together. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, this is amazing. And thank you all for allowing me to share this time with you. Um, I have a question actually, if I wanna share my screen, could I do that to show a video? Okay. Yes, absolutely. Let me change okay, that perfect. setting, good to go. Um, my name is Maya Arce and I'm 23. I'm originally from Tucson, Arizona and I moved here about three years ago. My dad lives here, so I just kind of was tired of Tucson and I just wanted to like um, dive more deeply into music. I've been playing mariachi since I was seven years old and I've loved it ever since. I've played ever since. And when I moved to LA, I joined this almost all female group, but our harpist is a man. He's amazing, but we, um, I'll talk a little bit more about it in a second, but we do like traditional jarocho, we do huasteco, we do many genres of Mexican music, we do current stuff too, or oldies, or cumbia, some selena, so we do all kinds of stuff. And um, I wanted to share a little bit of history about Chicano music and really how, um, what really influenced me as an artist and influenced a lot of Chicanos um, along the way. So Chicano music spans over many genres. It's not just one, many ideas. And Chicano music is different to a lot of people, to whoever you ask, pretty much. It's, um, but I want to talk about Lalo Guerrero. And he is a, actually from Tucson, so my hometown. A lot of people consider him the father of Chicano music. He was really like the first out Chicano like in media and, and everything. He was a pioneer. Um, there weren't any at the time, especially no one singing or recording in Spanish and English. And he shared his Chicano and his Mexican American perspective through music and shared that with the world. And a lot of his songs are, were funny, like they would have humor to them, but he would have sad songs and love songs too. But um, my tata, so my grandfather would always play this song with me because it would make me laugh. And it was called, there, There's No Tortillas. And like every time I'd go with him, I'd be like, Tata, please play the tortilla song, please, please, please. And so like the lyrics are something like, there's no tortillas, there's only bread. Without tortillas, my life is sad. And he goes on to like explain um, all of the things that wouldn't be if it weren't for tortillas. And I didn't realize at the time, like not only was my Tata making me laugh and have a good time, but he was like instilling in me pride for being Mexican American and, and like living in two worlds and you know like there's white bread over here but then at home we have tortillas and um all of that so uh and then it's interesting because on the contrast my other grandfather on my mom's side who's also from Tucson would tell me the story that involved tortillas but it was like on the contrary like super traumatizing for him because his 
um, his grand, his dad was in the army um, during World War II, so they had to move to Kansas. And so my grandfather was like the only Mexican family in town in Kansas. And he was like bullied for not speaking English good. And he remembers like his mom would pack him a lunch and would pack tortillas in it and the kids would make fun of him. So he started like throwing away his lunch and he's like, and then he asked his mom and he said like, I regret this so much like telling my mom, can you just make me like a sandwich or something normal? Because all the kids are laughing at me. And he's like, what the heck? That was like the best meal. Like I could never get that from my mom again. You know, that was made of love. And, um, but anyways, back to Lalo Guerrero. Um, he was around also when Bachucos were a thing and Zoot Suits, and he wrote a lot of the music for the Zoot Suit play. And um, so he really shared that. And he wrote this one song called No Chicanos on TV. Um, I'm going to play a little bit of that right now. Let me just, this was on, when he was on a show, this is when he's older in his life on a show called The Culture Clash. So, one second. Let me make sure the audio. A friend of ours, a mentor, and one of our elders. The sound went away. <laughs> it was on at first and then it went away. I shall never see any Chicanos on TV. <laughs> it seems as though we don't exist. And we're not ever even missed. <laughs> and yet we buy and buy their wares. But no Chicanos anywhere. The situation comedies. The Jeffersons and the Cosbys. Just change the channel and you get Arnold and Webster on the set. Their TV families are white, but not a Mexican in sight. <laughs> there are Chicanos in real life. Doctors, lawyers, husbands, wives. But all they show us on TV are illegal aliens as they flee <laughs> or some poor choro that they bust <laughs> flat on his face he's eating dust script writers never write for us i think it's time we raise the fuss I like, I'm just gonna tie it back into uh, what Jose said real quick, um, because he started talking about how when they do show us, it's like those all those stereotypes and that's it, right? We're just kind of yeah. we have to remind ourselves that we're, those things do exist, but we're so, so, so much more than that, right? And it'd be nice for the media to capture all those other things. But when they don't, we have Maya and Jose and a bunch of other amazing people that do it for us. <laughs> yeah, and it's crazy how, this song is just as relevant today today i don't i don't think that it's any less relevant so we're still going through these struggles to be um seen and recognized and represented how how we are um uh you guys saw um uh what harocho sounds like the traditional harocho my group does play some harocho music and um, we've gotten the opportunity to travel in 
pueblos in Mexico and learn from some of the best Jarocho musicians and um, just speak with them and be involved. It's like such a, a communal thing, like Jarocho music, everyone is involved no matter what, even if you're not a singer or a dancer, they'll have you go up and dance, they'll have you sing a verse. Jarocho is really cool because it's like hundreds of years old, but it allows you to improvise verses. So people can just sing about whatever they want, what they're seeing, what's going on. Um, and so I think uh, it's just since moving to LA and joining this group, it's been amazing how I, how much I can see how much like Jarocho has an influence on mariachi music and um, all kinds of music. So I um, am gonna show a clip of my group we were on, on this YouTube segment called The Breakfast Table, and we were playing a Jarocho song. This is a traditional song called El Siki City. So I'm gonna show that to you all. Um,
Thank you. Yay! <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, Jarocho music really features the harp, as you can tell, and I love that. And the guy playing the requinto, the guy dressed in black, he is actually Tomas Herrera, and he's part of the Herrera family, who are partly like responsible for bringing Jarocho music into the U.S. Like we learn from them too. I'm like grateful that we get to collab with them sometimes. So that's that's really cool. And um, we can, you know, we can learn from the best teachers and we can go to Mexico and, and try to do our best to interpret this music. But at the end of the day, it's through our perspective and it's through our experience. It's gonna be interpreted different. It's gonna, I'm gonna be playing these songs as a Chicana. It's gonna have its own unique feel, even though I'm playing, you know, a very old song. And um, I wanna say that the same way that Chicano music, um, one second. Okay. I wanna say that uh, the same way that Chicano music can mean and be a lot of things and not just be a singular concept, to me is exactly how explaining to someone what a Chicano is. It's, it's not a simple answer, it's complex. It's rooted in knowing your history and loving your roots not dimming your expression or your culture to assimilate, having an identity that's intersectional, you know, being a part of more than one world and being a part of a unique world at the same time and being proud of oneself and family and community and ancestors and um, just a culture that has developed with beautiful resiliency. That is so wow. beautiful, Maya. Um, I know that, like, I've watched uh, your your whole group um, perform. I think it was last year. Oh, it must have been before COVID. What am I thinking? Yeah. <laughs> um, but right before COVID, I think it was right before COVID. Um, and I remember you all, like, also you were singing a lot of um, modern songs, and there was a really there were there were some of the songs that also had that fusion, right, of like very yeah. Mexican, and then like that Chicano fusion in it. Mm -hmm. um, how do you all like go about figuring out what songs you want to um, bring into your repertoire? And like, how do you go about deciding how you fuse um, the two cultures? Yeah, well, um, most of us were born in the United States. So, um, well, all of us grew up with like um, all kinds of music you know, those of our, our parents, our grandparents, and then current stuff. So we enjoy all kinds of music. And we are even allowed to like say, hey, can I sing this song? Like uh, that famous song um, by Natalia La Furcade, Nunca es Suficiente. I sing that song because I was like, can I do this song? And we ended up playing it and we recorded it. And it's on our album, by the way. If you guys ever want to check us out on Spotify or Apple Music or anything, we're on there um, under Google Bella. But um, we do a lot of, we get hired for um, certain traditional, um, what are they called, conferences in Mexico. So for those, we do have to play a certain, certain songs, certain traditional songs. For, our, for concerts that are just in LA or, or wherever, or if we're playing at a restaurant, we play whatever we feel like playing. We love playing all the music. So we'll just like switch it up so that there's a variety. If we notice the crowd is like really liking something, we'll like, maybe play more of that or, yeah. Does anyone uh, have any questions or comments for Maya? I have a question. Um, I know you said that you would be singing at like restaurants and all of that. Have they ever asked you for like anything specific if you know, cause I know like with mariachi or like or any group they ask for a specific song if they know how to dance yeah we're okay. always asked uh we do take requests if we play it we'll know it we're asked a lot of mariachi songs that we'll play sometimes we're asked like strange things like um <laughs> i don't know like devil went down to georgia or like so, and we're just like what or some people are like can you play acdc and we're like no, like there's no electric guitar here. Like how would we do that? 
But um, no, people ask for a lot of things. We definitely try to play um, songs if we know them. We have a lot, we all were in mariachi like for years before this. So we all have a lot of mariachi rep under our belts. And, um, or like, if we don't know a song that someone requests, we'll just be like, well, do you feel like something more romantic or something more energetic and, and go from there. Some people ask a lot of like kids ask us to play Coco music from the movie Coco. So we like learned a song just so that <laughs> we could do that. And we play it so cute. Like seeing the kids get super excited, like, oh my gosh, it's Coco. Yeah, thank you for your question. That's a super popular one, I can imagine. Um, I was gonna, so, okay. So you all are like kind of open to be, um, open for hire for special events and whatnot yeah yes? yeah okay. we started playing again um you can like contact us on instagram that's how we get a lot of our gigs we're already booked for mother's day like we have i think eight serenatas to do that day starting at 7 a.m <laughs> so that's going to be crazy but we're starting to play at restaurants again this uh for cinco de mayo this wednesday we're playing in orange county or at placentia at a black bucket restaurant outside so things are picking up so i'm happy about that that's good how how has it been for you like during the pandemic and not really being able to perform around people has it been like oh this is a nice break we'll just keep practicing on our own or has it been like that you just miss being around that kind of both it i feel like it was a nice break but then at the same time like when we would get hired for something it'd be like a virtual thing so, and we, we're still doing a lot of virtual performances, but it's just that connection between the audience and like the band members is not there. So it's like really difficult. And like, like how Cafe Teras, they're super energetic. Even in uh, videos you see of them when they're just in a studio and there's no audience, they're super energetic still. And that's like something I struggle with because, or even if the audience is dead or something, it's really hard for me to like still like, have this energetic vibe it's much easier to feed off people so that's like something that's shown me like wow I need to work on being energetic and no matter what because the the disconnect between the audience during these times is weird and I guess that's something I miss the most is like being able to see people's reactions and feeding off of their energy I feel that I feel that I know that like um, when we go do our danzas it's mm -hmm. you could tell the difference between an um I don't really want to call it an audience for us because we're not performers per se we're more you know like a traditional ceremonial group but we mm -hmm. can feel the difference like for the people that are watching if they're like really into it and like yeah this is dope you know you can feel it you can feel their energy and it pumps you up and you can just keep going right and yeah. then um whereas sometimes the the energy isn't there from the audience and it's just like it's sucking out whatever you have left because there's nothing being exchanged so that makes a yeah. really big difference and i'm sharing that with you all because when you are being a um uh uh you know or in the audience or whatnot like that matters like it really really matters so just mm -hmm. you know the energy that you give is gonna um make a difference on on the performers so just know that for sure yeah. um it, is there any uh, any other um, uh, experiences or um, topics well, that you want to touch on? There's our, there's negative experiences sometimes, but I mean it doesn't affect me because I've I've been performing since I was little, so you never know what to expect when you're playing somewhere. But I've even recently, like we've played in in restaurants or places where you can tell they don't want you to be there, and like we're hired by the restaurant. It's not, it's not our fault, you know? And people are like, can you move, get out of the way? And like, just really like, really pissed off people. And like, I don't know, that's, it's very annoying. And it like takes all of us to just be like, okay, like, sorry, we're hired by the restaurant. I can't move, <laughs> you know? Those are like, or I've been um, hired for a, a, like a Cinco de Mayo party. And it's just like, white people and then we get there and they have they have like fake sombreros on and like fake mustaches on and you know it's like you can see that they have maybe a good intention because they're just trying to have a good time and they're nice to us but it's just like it's like a mockery almost like we're playing and they're like ha 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 but then you know I've, I've played at the Smithsonian where I'm where like people have taken the time to learn about us and like that was an amazing experience or playing in um 
in Mexico playing in Guadalajara, which the Teatro de Goyado is like a world renowned theater that was built in the 1600s. Um, and it's like a beautiful opera house. I got to play there and that was like one of the best experiences of my life. So it's just like such a range of, of things, but I think just playing the music makes it worth it to me and like the times that are good and you can see that you're making like someone cry because you're playing a song that they remember or that reminds them of something or making like people happy. I think that's what makes it really worth it to me. Any other questions, folks? I, I have another question if nobody else is gonna jump in. <laughs> yeah. um, for you, like, why do you feel that, like, why, why do you do this? Why do you feel it's important? Um, I think it's, it's important to like keep this alive, to keep like my culture alive and um, add my own perspective to it. And, and it's important to me because it's something that makes me feel good. And it's um, like, again, I just like seeing uh, when I play that it brings someone joy or like surprising people, like serenading them and, and just making people cry like happy tears. Like, I really love that. And I, I don't want that to die. And like, I don't think it's, it's going to but I'm just like happy that I'm a part of like keeping those traditions alive here in the United States. That's a beautiful thing. And you said you're how old? 22, 23? 23. Oh my goodness. You're so young and at the beginning of your life, you have all <laughs> this to look forward to and you're already making such huge contributions you've already made even as uh, in your younger years, <laughs> have already made such huge contributions. So I'm just really proud of you. And, and I'm thankful that you exist and that um, there's a group such as yours that is, is just embracing and celebrating and keeping it going. And um, I'm so happy all these opportunities that are uh, you know, presenting themselves to you and going to Guadalajara and all that, that's, that's awesome. Good for you. And I'm just, um, thank you for coming to our class. Thank you for visiting us and for sharing your beautiful talents with us and everything that you're doing. I really, really appreciate you taking the time. So thank, thank you, you for so being much. with us. Thank you so much. I Maya. appreciate like, you giving me this opportunity and being able to like speak to you all. It means a lot. So thank you. Of course, of course. Anytime, anytime. So folks, I'm going to ask um, for you all to stay in class. But first, Go ahead and unmute yourself and give your thanks and your goodbyes to Maya. Again, thank you, Maya, for being with us. And then the rest of you just hang tight here, okay? But go ahead and unmute. Thank you, Maya. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.